Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day four of Blockchain Week. In this session, we're going to dive into the world of custody and digital assets. Scott Hudson, he's the General Manager and Market Liaison at ComputerShare, will lead this important discussion and introduce his fellow speakers. Take the stage, Scott. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks very much, and thanks to, to Blockchain Australia for, for putting on a fantastic range of, uh, of events and speakers uh, right through this week. Um, had the pleasure of being up in Sydney earlier on in the week and then um, and then for NFT Day down here in Melbourne yesterday. And I think uh, this custodian uh, and digital asset sessions, it's got aspects that are really close to our hearts at, uh, at ComputerShare where, you know, across 20 capital markets, we look after 100 million investor accounts uh, for, for, for 12,000 listed companies. And so, you know, the safekeeping of data, the safekeeping of assets uh, and administration of those is, is something that's really topical. I've got a phenomenal panel uh, with, with me here today. And frankly, in thinking about the time that we've got allocated and uh, versus the, the quality of the speakers, I think uh, could easily be blockchain month next year. So Steve, just put that one down as a, as a point. So um, yeah, joining me today, I've got uh, Alex Maron, uh, David Lebecki, Jeff Yu, uh, Tanya uh, Sibbery from, from EY, and then uh, Ryan McCall. So before we kick off um, you know, with, with a couple of questions and talking points, maybe if, um, if we start off with Tanya, maybe just uh, one, one or two quick minutes on, on who you are, uh, your firm, and then um, you know, how you sort of got, you found your way into blockchain or, and, and digital assets. Thanks, Scott. Hi, everybody. And thanks for joining this afternoon. Um, quickly, I joined EY last year as a partner in the financial services um, office in the legal department. Um, I've actually been working here with custodians for the best part of my career. I previously worked at HSBC in Hong Kong, covered 18 markets across um, all of Asia. Um, so, and then prior to that, I was uh, general counsel um, for Bank of New York Mellon here in Australia and as well in Hong Kong and in London. Um, have done a lot of work, um, obviously on the custody side, but more recently on um, looking at cryptocurrencies, particularly around um, obviously what's happening here in Australia around the new Senator Bragg um, recommendations. And more recently, we know this week, we've got the recommendations that's come through from Treasury. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you, you go next. Yeah, sure. So um, my name is Jeff Yu. So I run a, I run an asset management firm called Monochrome Asset Management. So we deal with um, education and secure access and custody to, um, you know, uh, very conservatively um, approved um, crypto assets to be managed into a, um, you know, a managed investment scheme. Um, so uh, what, what sort of interests me in this space is definitely uh, the rise of institutions. Um, I, I was previously the uh, the co-founder and CEO of um, Binance Australia, so I've seen the sort of retail excitement, and also also assembled a team of um, you know, traditional experts, including talents from Bank of New York, um, you know, IFM Equity Trustees, BlackRock, etc., to to you know solve this in industry problem with you know the rest of the uh, rest of the cohort over here. Awesome, David. Hi, so I'm David Lavecki, CEO and co-founder of Canvas. We're a tech company, we're a gateway to Web3. So clients around the world use us like hedge funds, family offices and private clients. They're using our APIs, software and digital currency exchange to manage their digital asset portfolios across DeFi, lending, staking and NFTs. We operate custody for all of our clients. So it's a really important part of our business. My brother and I, we co-founded the company together. We've worked together in fintech for over 22 years. This is our next venture. Started working in the digital asset space in 2015. Started Canvas in 2017. And really uh, happy to be part of this discussion. Custody is a huge part of our business and it's a huge part of the space overall. Excellent. Uh, Alex? Yeah, hi everyone. Alex Marin, Head of Operational Risk at Vault Bank. We're a neo bank based out of Sydney. My remit also covers our digital asset strategy. We've been engaged with the sector for a number of years now, and we're partnering with likes of BTC Markets as part of our banking as a service model. Um, I've been really fortunate to be involved with Senator Bragg as part of the crypto reform plans. And really for me, got into the sector in 2017, previously advised uh, a blockchain analytics company called Merkle Science that's growing phenomenally across uh, Asia and, and the US. Excellent. And uh, Ryan. Hi. 
Uh, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of ZeroCap. Um, we're an Australian-based uh, wealth management firm that specializes in cryptocurrency, um, also providing liquidity and custody to the ecosystem. Um, we uh, were founded in about 2017 and specialize in servicing private clients. Uh, so point out with individuals, family offices, and increasingly institutions. Uh, so we see ourselves as a bridge between that traditional finance world and the digital asset class. Awesome, awesome. So, look, hopefully, though, for everyone online, you know, clearly an outstanding, uh, you know, some outstanding experience sitting on this panel. We um, we had a quick catch up call yesterday. We were sort of planning uh, some talking points, um, and that got thrown out the window this morning when uh, ANZ sort of came out and uh, with their announcement around their their AU stable coin. Which um, look, Ryan, I'm going to throw straight to you. Keep the microphone. Um, you know, just given Zero Cap's role involved in that transaction and that initiative, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about what, what you've done there and then, you know, that, that sort of transaction more broadly and, you know, where do you sort of see this coming? You know, we spoke about this with Jane Hume on, at lunch on Monday, uh, you know, touched on it lightly, but, yeah, tell us about the transaction, your role, and then where do you see this sort of thing going? Yeah, sure. So, look, it's a super exciting thing for the industry, um, not just in Australia, but globally, right? Like, you know, uh, as far as we're aware, this is a world first for a bank to actually issue their own stable coin. And stable coins, you know, are a really important part of the um, overall ecosystem. So our, our role um, in this transaction was we, we shared a client with ANZ, um, which is the, the Victor Swarman Group. And, uh, you know, we provide asset management um, for, for, for BSG and they wanted to transfer us um, $30 million to, to deploy. And in collaboration with, with ANZ, um, that was done through their new um, Aussie dollar stable point. So, um, you know, this is something that we worked on together for, for a few months and uh, it all happened uh, just in, in the last few days. And look, impeccable as I said, time. what's that, sorry? Impeccable timing. Yeah, yeah. You could almost say it was planned, hey? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but, but it is really significant. Uh, I think it just shows you how serious, um, you know, the bank, big four banks are here in Australia and just traditional institutions generally about getting involved um, in, in the ecosystem. Awesome. Um, Tanya, maybe um, if, I, if I can ask you a question, you know, there at, that, that, that role there at EY, you're going to be working with a, a really good mix of, you know, new firms, new economy firms, um, you know, as well as, you know, more traditional enterprise type businesses. Um, so have you got any sort of thoughts on, you know, sort of this type of initiative going forward, you know, to the degree that you can, you know, this, this, these types of transactions, um, and then also, you know, I sort of would love to hear your thoughts on the, the Treasury consultation that came out uh, on Monday around licensing and custody requirements. Yeah, so I, 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 I well, congrats, Ryan, firstly. I mean, it's a pretty great achievement, to be honest. Yeah. Um, just obviously saw the announcement today as well. Um, I mean, obviously, I think it's probably going to be the first of many. Um, and obviously, with ANZ leading the way, it's obviously going to, create a momentum um uh, i haven't personally um done a, a lot of work um in terms of um looking at a stable point option i've done a lot of work in terms of looking at the actual crypto side um and so i guess i can talk mostly about your second point in terms of where the treasury consultation has come from and um you know you know obviously the other people on the panel who's, who've been part of senator bragg's um recommendations um it's 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 quite interesting in in what's actually come out in that there is um possibly going to be a secondary um type of license um for custodians who are going to be holding crypto and so you could imagine that there might be um you know the big players out there you know the global institutions that will then have a responsibility then to hold two licenses which seems a little bit incongruous in terms of um what what they're trying to aim at because 
Um, obviously, the main custodians at the moment will have all the compliance requirements. They'll be compliant with RG133. They'll have all the capital requirements. So I think that that will need to sort of be worked around in terms of whether there's a dual licensing regime, um, because it just seems a bit of a bit strange to have two um, two licenses that are very similar. Um, I can understand why. Um, the government is wanting to have a separate license though, um, particularly for those retail operators, um, you know, because we've got a lot of crypto custodians here in the market who are not regulated. And obviously that's gonna be a regime that I suspect that those industry players will form part of. Um, so I suspect what will happen is that the, 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 the retail players will come under that, um, the CAS PR. Um, license um, regime and that the global institutions will continue to hold an AFSL and there'll be some form of um, leveraging of what they're holding at the moment. I think the real challenge will be obviously the capital requirements. Um, insurance obviously is still an issue. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the actual nuances around, you know, what it will mean um, in terms of digital, different types of assets that we're holding um, and, and when they're tethered to tokens as well. Um, you know, how are custodians going to be able to ensure that they're backed? Um, so similar to like a DR, you know, you have always going to have a depository receipt. You've got to have an underlying holding. You know, how is that going to be um, operated to make sure that you've got those, um, the direct comparisons and the direct, um, you know, book entries and so forth. Um, but yeah, so it's great, great achievement, Ryan. And um, a lot more, I think, will come from a regulatory perspective. Um, and I think this is obviously just going to be the first of, you know, uh, you know, first consultation, and I'll be working with AXA on, on our recommendations on that. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Maybe, um, maybe Jeff, do you want to, do you want to sort of share some, share some thoughts? You're on mute, buddy. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so um, the custody issues uh, extend more than just, you know, uh, like Tanya suggested, more than just custody, right? Licensing, um, uh, insurance, the big, big, big issue, uh, complying with, you know, RG133, especially with existing unregulated custodians, that that'll be definitely a, a sort of, you know, heel to climb. Uh, but what's interesting is that we've, we've seen sort of potential uh, traditional players that are, you know, taking up that role as well to, to, to complement that whole um, traditional expertise versus the, you know, the new innovators in the space. Um, we, we are, you know, for example, we are building um, and, and we are participating in the Bitcoin ETF um, game here in Australia. And we have seen um, that the benefit of having two worlds sort of merging together with both expertise um, to, to come up with the product. And I think that's the way to go. Like we have to work together, you know, the old, the old and the new for the lack of the better the ex this description. Uh, and that is the only way to, to, to do it. I, I see it because um, custody of digital assets, as most of us here are very aware, but not maybe outside of this room, is that it is very different from um, custody, say, securities or any traditional assets, including, say, gold. Um, there are very uh, significant um, sort of cost of mistakes uh, compared to you know losing say you know securities losing people go um, and that's where digital expertise is very helpful and very uh, very important in that conversation. Yeah, I, look, I, I completely agree. And you know, you sort of mentioned just then the old and the new, and and Tanya sort of mentioned this as well in terms of tethering and you know being similar to sort of depository receipts. And I think there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of things that we see in, you know, sort of the old world and some of those, you know, more mature enterprises can bring some of that great experience to some of these new areas. Um, and, you know, I mean, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday at Marvel and talking about how, you know, when Computer Share runs an IPO and we issue shares, that's pretty similar to sort of minting something. So, you know, there's a difference in the language, but when you actually unwrap these things, they do sometimes feel and sound a little bit similar. So I think that, you know, that coming together of the old and the new is, you know, is, I think it's going to be really important. And I think that goes to, you know, the whole point of this week, which is the, the mainstream moments. And I think, you know, we've got a, re hopefully we've got a really nice balance of that old and new, um, you know, today and then on a go forward basis. Um, maybe Alex, I'll uh, throw to you for some, some thoughts on licensing and custody. 
Yeah, look, um, thanks for that, Scott. Look, I think the, the release by Treasury, um, Senator Bragg's really a, a good next step. Obviously, it's only a consultation paper and we need a lot more detail to come out. But I guess a lot of us have been calling for what these minimum standards and obligations are really going to look like. Because as sort of Tanya alluded to, you know, there's billions of dollars worth of digital assets sitting under custody under local crypto exchanges um, without a regime. Um, and I guess where I sort of, from a risk-based approach, I tend to look at these things. So have we got things around that cover us for technology and cyber risk, financial risk, um, reputational conduct and operational risk? And taking a deeper dive, looking at these obligations, I think it's really positive. It's kind of talking about security of private keys, goes to the heart around, you know, um, independent verification around cyber security practices, um, and also it's starting to touch on competence. Um, so when I look at a custody provider, um, I think we also need to be thinking about skills, capabilities and competence of that team that's going to be responsible for storage of people's assets. Um, and then I guess probably to build on that, the other point that I think Tanya and also Jeff alluded to already, the financial requirements or capital levels a Treasury's got to get a fine balance here between protecting consumers, but also allowing competition. Um, so there will be that old and the new guard, but you know, I'm keen to see for some more detail around what are those capital levels. Yeah, I, th I, th I think regulatory capital um, and those levels are going to be really, you know, really important to get right because if that hurdle is too big, you're not going to have the, you know, the newer entrance. It'll be left to, you know, those those big balance sheet often global firms, um, you know, and th that are there, you know, doing this in more traditional asset classes now. But again, yeah, if you have that barrier too low or that hurdle too low, then, you know, maybe there's a reduction in the level of, of protection. And so getting that trade off right, I think, is you're exactly right. It's going to be really interesting. So um, can, David, I, can I just jump yes. in there? Yeah, right. So, yes. uh, you know, you look at um, the way the incidental custody works. Um, in you know, traditional financial products at, at the moment. So, you know, there's this concept of incidental custody and a professional custodian. So like zero cap as an asset manager, we're regulated, we're a car under an AFSL and we're authorized to provide incidental custody. So when custody is not the main thing that you are selling, it's incidental to what you are actually selling, uh, you know, which might be, a, you know, uh, units in a, in a fund or, or, or something like that, then, that's something that is is authorised, and I, I hope that you know just talking about capital requirements, that's sort of a, a similar sort of path that, that we go down here. Where you know if, if if a custodian or a business that is selling custody that that is the thing that they are selling, then yeah, I think they should have some pretty significant capital requirements. But if you're talking about like you know a, a startup business or some kind of retail service, um, and the custody aspect is incidental to what they're providing, then, then I don't think the bar should be as high. Okay, interesting, interesting. David, any, uh, any, any thoughts or comments from you? Yeah, thanks, Scott. You mentioned the old and the new, and Jeff uh, touched on the technology side. This is all digital. And so we're talking about custody. The regulatory part is critical, but it's also the technology part. And you need to have the technology infrastructure to protect the private keys, which ultimately protects the funds at rest. And so we started in 2017 in custody, the technology was really different to what it is now. It was super basic, there was no regulatory regimes. And at that time, it was really about uh, putting the keys deep underground in secure bunkers and having cold storage and offline storage and uh, very secure, but it doesn't scale and it doesn't work with real-time applications like we all expect. And so back then the exchanges all developed their own solutions to put the keys online. That led to disastrous hacks and, and funds lost. And so really what was the pivotal moment in this over the last few years is the development of multi-party computation or technology that allows the keys to be split into parts and then held by the custodians and only comes together at the time when it comes time to do a transaction. So that means you have the technical infrastructure in place to run a custody business uh, in line with the regulatory regime. And so now it's being uh, actively implemented and commercialized by the likes of Fireblocks. And so we have, uh, the reg we have the technical infrastructure to run the uh, 
custody business, and then we have the regulatory side. So all of the work coming out of Senator Bragg and Senator Hume, the announcements earlier this week are great. And it puts us uh, on a global level alongside Wyoming, Singapore, and Switzerland, allows us to work with domestic providers so they don't have to go uh, to overseas. So we'd, we'd expect that domestic financial institutions will come to local operators as opposed to going offshore and also allows us to compete on a global basis. Yeah, and look, I, th I think, David, you know, as a, as a Melbourne-born and bred global business, you know, um, computer share is really keen to sort of see that, you know, that, that e ecosystem and those opportunities really flourish here in Australia. And, um, you know, and I know sitting in a meeting with Jane Hume a couple of years ago and, you know, the, the room was really sort of calling out for, you know, more regulation and more certainty to sort of, um, you know, give more comfort to local operators and reduce the amount of offshoring and brain drain that was going on. So hopefully, you know, hopefully that does deliver a good thing, you know, for the, the op, you know, the founders, the, the organisations and, and ultimately the Australian economy. And, you know, we can actually maximise the opportunities that are, you know, that are available here in this really exciting, really exciting space. Um, I'm going to wrap up uh, in, in a few minutes with like a, you know, where do you think things go in five years' time? But before we get to that question, I go around the, around the grounds there. Um, you know, there's a lot of focus on custody from an assets perspective. Um, you know, I think the, you know, the other thing that we were sort of chatting through yesterday was, you know, custody of identity and, you know, AML, KYC, um, CTF, you know, what are the thoughts on, um, you know, of, of the group on custody of identity on a, you know, both today and as we move forward? Tanya, I've got you on my phone screen here. So do you want to do you want to yeah. start off there? I, I just think we're already doing it. I mean, we've already got a lot of that data. So, um, you know, even though people might not be aware of that, that that, that is just the reality of, of the way we, you know, we, where we operate. So, yeah. Um, it's about how that data is stored and, and making sure that there is, you know, robust cyber um, plans in place to make sure it's obviously um, controlled and, you know, it's held in a, in, in a, you know, a secure environment. But I, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, we're already doing that. Um, one thing to note though, um, and I just want to make a comment about, you know, talking about, you know, the, the, the storage um, in terms of the, the protection of keys. I, I find it quite interesting because um, Josh Frydenberg made some comments last week about the fact that he had expected all of the um, stories to be held onshore in Australia. And the way that custodians normally operate, you know, as you would be aware, everyone has, you know, global data centres, you know, offshore. So I wonder how that will actually affect where this is going. Um, because whilst, you know, you'll have your front office in, uh, you know, the main location in Australia, you'll need those data centres offshore in terms of costs and so forth. So I, I just, I had that as like a, a big sort of question mark in my mind, particularly because it hasn't been addressed in, in the Senate um, papers. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got some about. thoughts on that, T Tanya. So, I mean, David, you, you mentioned Fireblox before. So Zero Count was actually Fireblox. Um, we were their first customer here in, in Australia. And the way that they do their key sharding, and you know, you spoke to this, Tanya, um, like that is out of the box, uh, hosted on cloud infrastructure, which would be sitting outside Australia. But that can be configured um, pretty much any way you want. Like it can be cloud infrastructure that's here in Australia, or it can e even be on-prem, right? So I, I think, you know, those comments that Josh Frydenberg made they're interesting because I think a lot of people still think about this as there's this tension between like is it data and then you sort of think about it in the same way as you know privacy laws and we want to keep all the data on onshore or is it you know like an asset and do we treat treat it like a traditional asset that, that we custody and that, that there's like a, a tension there but I like I do think I mean that problem has already been solved if we want to store the data the private key shards um, onshore. I think following on from that, I heard Sorry. yesterday uh, Michael from Fireblock speaking in the afternoon. 
And he put it really succinctly when he said that you have to have the independence that if the international internet connections got cut or if you couldn't reach the infrastructure of your custodian overseas, that you'd be able to connect to it. So I think from that perspective, Tanya, having a local backup or having independence just in general from Fireblocks or the like as a technology vendor and having your own backups that are secured and that could operate independently, that's the solution there in my mind. So not, not so much the, we should have globally distributed infrastructure, we should have independence over the private key, complete self-sovereignty. I, I think yeah. sort of what, 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 what I observe is that definitely there's a, there's, I, I always keep coming back to the gap, right? Like we all know the, the ins and out of digital custodies and all those quirks um, and having that involvement in policy decisioning to implementation is very important because last thing you want is that you have you know you have the best implementation but you have a you have a something that that just doesn't make sense from a from a policy perspective not saying that it, it is at the moment just that's the risk of that so things something as simple give you an example is that um, we've noticed that a lot of people don't even really understand what cold storage even means right cold storage is not a it's not like a secret sort of wallet it is the is the, it is describing a process of generating private keys because like if your generate your, your process of generating private keys is custody you know is compromised there is no security you can put on storing those private keys later on that can prevent a theft and these kind of concepts may sound very complicated and foreign to um some of the more traditional new players but this is where guys like you know um, Ryan, I, and um, the, the other panelists here would have the, um, the that sort of years of experience, and you know, I, I will not, I will not sort of um, overplay by saying maybe thousands of hours of um, learning in this space that have you know came to all these observations, and that would be very helpful um, uh, if we all work together. Excellent, really, really great insight, um, Alex. I think uh, I think it'll last last one with a mic yeah. on, uh, on this point. Look, on this one, you know, I just think of it versus local versus international. This is just going into like prudent op risk management. This is around having appropriate backups, having local versus international. Um, I think obviously a bit more education needs to be done. We've got some incredibly low, um, amazing sort of local providers doing um, some great work in this space. But I think obviously these kind of comments that we're talking about today, and I think many in the industry, need to provide submissions back to Treasury as part of this review period to make sure we get this right um, before the final regulations come out. Well, very good, very good. So I think, you know, I, I, um, I think about, uh, you know, the industry, the blockchain industry, where things have sort of really come over the last five years. Um, and, you know, it's, it's come a long way clearly you know, just having a, you know, who, who we're talking to, who, who the people are on some of these panels this week, um, you know, it's evolved massively in a very, relatively a very short period of time. What does five years look like? Get in a DeLorean, go forward five years. David, I've got you on my screen here. What, what does five years time look like, do you think? Uh, it's a very exciting time. So a dramatic expansion from where we are now and many more people than the 5 million that are currently using DeFi. And so there's a lot of challenges that need to be solved, particularly around custody is important. Uh, user experience and user interface is really important as well. If you think about using DeFi today, you have to be totally comfortable with self-custody and that's beyond the reach of many, many people. And so if we're thinking about the next 500 million people, uh, things like custody, things like uh, on-chain identity and working through AML and KYC. And a lot of these things are just gonna evolve and become a natural part of the technology. Yeah, very good. Tanya? I uh, totally agree. I think there's gonna be a substantial amount of work to do, um, which is great. Um, uh, like like anything, but I think what's exciting is, you know, like if you look at the, the announcement today, I think it's really exciting. Um, first of one and many um, to come. And it's, I think, you know, where we're going to be in five years time, is going to be quite different from now. Um, it, things do take a little bit of time though in Australia from a regulatory perspective, as we know. So it's not going to take, you know, a couple of months for these things to, to develop. Um, I think in five years time, we'll, we will have that platform. We'll understand the licensing regimes, whether it's two separate licenses or, or what have you, um, but it'll be a much clearer environment. There'll be protections in place. Um, 
for people to be able to make that investment and it will be a really competitive landscape. And I think Australia is probably one of the leading um, jurisdictions in this regard. So uh, I think it's quite quite exciting time for us to be working on this. Tanya, just a quick question before I then move the mic around. Should we yeah. go quicker from a regulatory perspective? At least try and go um, quicker? It would be great if we were, because I think we are sometimes a little bit slow um, and we're playing catch up. So, you know, we've already had Vanek, you know, with their first ETF in Canada, you know, we're, we're nowhere near that here. And um, why, why aren't we, um, you know? And, and we've got people bidding on our doors, trying to, trying to work out how to actually issue ETFs um, yeah. for Bitcoin. Yeah. So. Yeah, I guess the, the, the counter, sorry, Scott, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in. Yeah, the, the counter to that might be the lack of regulation has allowed all this innovation to, to flourish. And, and fortunately, here in Australia, we've avoided any major disasters, right? I mean, there's certainly been examples of, you know, a couple of businesses that have collapsed and, and things like that. But, but on the whole, it, it's been pretty, um, pretty positive. Uh, but now I do think regulation is important to take that next step in the evolution of, of the adoption. You know, you've got major institutions that are, you know, obviously like ANZ now getting into it, but a lot that are waiting from an investment perspective, um, you know, like uh, superannuation funds and, um, you know, sovereign funds and, and the like that will really need regulation and, and the protections like custody licensing and all that sort of thing that, that come with it. Um, just to quickly answer the question that you asked, Scott, I think like in five years, I would hope that, like, I don't think blockchain technology will be ubiquitous, but I think there'll be a lot of examples where people don't even realize that they're actually, you know, what, what they're interacting with is utilizing the, the blockchain. Somehow. So it becomes more about the outcome and the service rather than the engine. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there's a long way that we need to go in terms of user experience to, to really enable that. But, um, you know, we've got some really talented, bright people here in Australia. It's a great community, like as we've seen throughout this whole blockchain great. week. Yep. People really uh, genuinely, you know, partnering and helping to grow the ecosystem together. Yep. Um, so I think we're in a really good place. Um, the, the, the other sort of trend that we're seeing or well, that I think that we'll see over the next five years, just the tokenization of everything. And we've kind of touched on it here, talking about identity, um, but you know, there's obviously this explosion of NFT art and you know, what's happening in the metaverse and bonds on the blockchain, you know, carbon credits, uh, you know, property titles, like really everything um, is, is what I think we'll be seeing over the next five years. A lot of experimentation, um, a few stumbles, but uh, yeah, on the whole, I think it's going to be great. Absolutely, I think, and you know, we've uh, we've all got a great box seat to that very, very exciting, uh, exciting journey. Alex, five years, where are you? Yeah, look, I couldn't agree more with you know um, what Ryan just talking about. Look, the remit's going to be so much bigger than just cryptocurrencies, NFTs. Traditional debt and equity markets are going to be very much engaged in this. How it's all going to become digitized? How we're going to run off the smart contracts? Where stable coins, how do we provide as custody providers support for DeFi lending? Um, I also think traditional financial institutions, there are going to be some that are going to look to provide direct custody and trying to become that one stop shop for all things digital assets. And then others will go, let's partner with some of the great tech startups that are doing amazing custody solutions as well. Um, and I guess finally, looking towards the future, and it's it's not rocket science, but once you're starting to dominate in the custody space, servicing clients, you're going to be thinking about what are those complementary services. So many in the sector are already looking at staking, lending type services. And I think that'll just be a natural thing in the next five years. And, then, and you know, again, going back to that old and new, you know, we certainly see that, you know, those diversified offerings out of traditional custodians today, right, where the safekeeping of the assets is one thing. Then there's you know loaning of securities, there's foreign exchange, there's a whole range of other things that uh, that go on. So I think that's a you know a very natural evolution and diversification and growing of the of the service offering. 
Jeff, five years. How many how many businesses will you have uh, launched in that time, mate? I think like with, when we're speaking in the digital asset space, um, five years is uh, it is a century. Um, we we live we live in a much shorter time frame than that because of how the, the velocity of change, right? So it's, it's so exciting. So what 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 one thing that um, Tanya spoke about is the the, the issue of the. Bitcoin ETF. I think that the, the because we are we are very well ahead in the ETF play. Um, I think I'm very confident to say that Monochrome is probably um, well ahead with other sort of race uh, in the players in the race. Um, that we have seen so many things that um, frankly we we are the first one that are solving all these problems. Custody at the moment isn't the biggest problem uh, because um, under Report Seven Zero Five that was released late last year, ASIC has given us relief and issue was relieved to use um, overseas cust- custodians that you know fulfill the RG One Three Three and also RG One Two Six on insurance um, as long as it's all all protected in the right way. Uh, the biggest problem right now is actually surprisingly um, um, I wouldn't go too much into detail, but it, it would require its own panel, probably two hours long uh, of that. But that's a, that's a story for another time. But it is not, nothing related to, to custody. Uh, uh, it is mainly just, um, um, I would sum it up by saying that leave the bread to the bakers kind of thing, because when you are not an expert in something and trying to sort of squeeze around that and trying to work fast through it, um, mistakes will happen. And this mistake will cause delays to the entire industry, which is what, uh, that's what I've been very ad- very vocal in advocating. We should all work together, all and you work together. Don't, you know, we, we are not experts in that, that, you know, some of these fields and they are not experts in some of these fields. But if we all work together, like we will, uh, we, we will be Australia to the global map when it comes to these type of products. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, really exciting. So I think that's time. Um, open mic. Who wants to sort of leave the the lasting uh, the lasting gem from the session? Well, look, I'll, I'll just say one thing. Um, you know that there's been a few comments that I've seen on social media um, just around this whole ANZ thing, which I totally expected, which was a little bit of pushback on. You know, doesn't a traditional institution getting involved? You know, isn't isn't this against the ethos of a decentralized system and and i i think you know consumers and institutions alike need safe rails um and banks have a role to to play in that absolutely but what i what i hope for the future like again thinking about five years is that we've got centralized systems and decentralized systems and the users can opt in to whichever ecosystem they want i, I wouldn't want you know regulations to force uh you know consumers down any particular path i think it's important to to give people choice yeah uh, one of the things i picked up on social media ryan for you and the anz transaction was um michael Bettina on the twitter blockchain australia twitter twitter space this morning during yesterday's debrief and looking forward to today was um the most exciting news of the entire week so I think, um, you know, out of so much that's going on, so much cool, so many cool things, so many great initiatives, I think that's a, you know, that's a huge call from someone who's, you know, deeply experienced and deeply respected in this space. So, um, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of dialogue and debate, but, um, you know, I put a lot, of, uh, a lot of faith in, you know, sort of his views and thoughts. So that one should be, you know, when, if, you, if you're seeing negativity, then keep on coming back to the positive stuff. Um, I think we're a couple of minutes over, so I just wanted to say, yeah, look, thank thank you so much for uh, for all of your insights. Clearly, uh, forty odd minutes, not uh, not nearly enough time. Um, but um, yeah, thank you, uh, thank thanks to to Ryan, Alex, David, Tanya, uh, and Jeff. Thank you, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks very much.